Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm Mr. P and I'm joined today by Dr. Jennifer Rivera and we are going to be talking about forensic footprints. Yes. So thinking about that, what background do you have that kind of helps you understand what we're talking about today? Yes, used to work in a crime scene unit, taught forensic science for many, many years, uh, still involved in that forensic community today, uh, speaking at conferences and things like that. So this is a great workshop uh, that kids are going to learn a lot about how unique we are as humans, as well as something fun they can do at home. All right, mm -hmm. so lots of great information today. I will be following along on Ken Ham's Facebook page, monitoring some comments. So if you've got any comments or questions you'd like us to address, I'll try and keep an eye on those. We'll watch those during the episode and try and answer some of those things. And if not, we'll get to them when we, uh, we can back on the Facebook page and, and deal with those things. So you mentioned a second ago that you're going to talk a little bit about how we're different from animals mm -hmm. and being created uniquely by God. So when we think about humans and the way God has created us, and we read uh, in Genesis that God created man on the sixth day of creation and the other land animals, so we think of things like uh, gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees that a lot of people think are our evolutionary relatives or our cousins, we would say God says that's not the truth. The truth is in the Bible and it says that God created especially and different from those animals. And so the way that we walk, the way that we talk, the way that we interact with, with one another is very different from animals. So we've got an image down here on the table. I'll bring this up front just to give you a little bit of an idea about that. some of those differences. We're going to look at human footprints today. So over here we can see a picture of a human foot and it's set next to a gorilla foot. This is a pretty large gorilla and maybe a large male. And if you look there, you can probably notice a few key differences right off the bat. The first thing you might notice is this, the big toe on the gorilla points out to the side. So it mo looks more like a hand than it does our foot, where our big toe is pointed in line with the heel and with the other toes. So here on the gorilla, the big toe is pointed off at an angle to the side. So that's a big difference. You might also notice it doesn't look like he has a very prominent heel and the gorillas in their back feet and chimps and orangutans, they don't have an arch in their foot. So you notice a strong curve on the inside that we call the arch of our foot. And our heel makes a very prominent strike when we hit the ground. And then we roll through the outside of our foot onto the toes. Uh, gorilla walks very differently. So if we were to think about the way that a gorilla walks, and the way their pelvis is structured, the way their feet are structured, we get a very different gait. Okay, so there's our big science word of the day, gait. Now it's not like the gait on a fence, it's G-A-I-T, the way that we walk. So in science we call that a creature's gait. So a horse and a crocodile and a human and a, a gorilla have different gait patterns and we can analyze those and, and think about the way things walk. So what are some of the other things that are different about a human and the way they walk with, um, compared to an ape? Well, definitely one of the key things we can see, especially when they leave behind impressions, is what those impressions look like. So in a human, because of our anatomical design, when we walk, our feet are naturally pointed outward. And so, in fact, if you look down at your feet and just take a couple steps, you'll notice that your feet, your toes, slightly point outward when you walk, and you can almost see that, right? We don't walk straight like this. It would be unnatural for us. In fact, primates, though, very much when they walk, because of their pelvic structure is different, walk very much with their feet almost straight like this. So we can look at a set of impressions and know immediately, right, whether mm -hmm. it is human or whether it is some type of animal, just by that impression that's left yeah, behind. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we think about the idea of examining footprints in forensic science, what are some of the situations where uh, footprints might be used as evidence in an investigation? All right, any time where someone has been on a scene, you always leave behind a piece of yourself there. We've talked about, you know, about that a little bit in previous episodes. So footprint is one of those things that you can leave behind. So if someone were to walk through something sticky, uh -huh. uh, then sometimes you think about walking through syrup or some stickies on your kitchen floor and you've walked through and left your sneaker impression behind. 
that is pretty much a piece of evidence that we could use. Uh, other times, that could also be tracked along, right, and then be filled up with along. dust, and we could sure. see the pathway of someone. Anything mm -hmm. chalky, even soil can be left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, clay, different things like that. You can leave traces of your footwear impressions behind, and other substances as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to be walking through the basic process of how to gather footprint evidence mm -hmm. and examine that. And then we're going to feature this in our hands-on episode for Friday mm -hmm. and talk more about that, give you some more details about that casting process and give you the instructions and an activity that you can do at home, uh, either as a family or schooling mm -hmm. situation, whatever you're using this for. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so um, Luke asked me why Claude is hanging out in the soil. <laughs> we can pull him out of there. We're not going to need him for a while. We're not casting. We're not taking today. Claude's no. footprints, <laughs> no. but Claude would leave behind very distinct very footprints dis yes. in the very in the sand as well. So. Okay, so we're going to simulate mm -hmm. me as a criminal. Yes. That's that's totally fake. I would never <laughs> do anything. Like this. So um, we're going to take this box here. Now you can do this outside mm -hmm. in a garden space or a flower bed or anywhere mm -hmm. where there's some bare soil. We're going to simulate casting a footprint here inside of this container. So I have bit, pretty big feet, so we've got a big box here. And if you come in and look, we've got some basically some loose sand and dirt here. This is pretty good. Now the sand and dirt, we got this dirt has some of these big chunks of sticks and pine straw. And we might want to kind of pull some of those out. So it works best if you make a nice little level surface. And Especially if you had rocks and things yeah. like that, you'd want to pull those out if you're going to do this in a box. Yep. So let's set this down on the floor. And to get a good impression, I'm going to kind of fake walk through here. So when we walk, we normally plant our heels on the ground and roll through. So I'm basically going to do that. And this is going to be a little tricky. I hope I don't trip. <laughs> and roll through. And we'll see how that impression came out. I, it doesn't look too bad. I think okay. we see some circles. Mm -hmm. It might work a little better if the dirt were a little damp. Yeah, a little yeah. damp helps, mm -hmm. right? If you kind of try to press down a little when Let you walk through. Let me see if we can I get one more. Be, I'll shake it up first because we don't want... Let there get you it go. Across. Okay. Let's try it one more time. We're going to get all my weight on there. There you go. No jokes, no fat jokes now, kids. <laughs> okay, get all my weight on there. Get a good sturdy impression. Just oh, for demonstration. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is so better. So it's probably hard to see in the camera because it's brown dirt on brown dirt, but we can definitely <laughs> see the impressions in there. Okay, so you're going to lift that carefully. So we don't want to mess up our impression. Okay. Let's pull all this up. So we are going to uh, make a cast of this impression uh, that we can then later compare. Uh, to Mr. Patterson's shoe if we wanted to. So this might be something you would find out if it was a burglary scenario, we might have a footprint outside of a window where right. we think a suspect entered the window or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. And you have to get a suspect and then you could go get their shoe and then you could compare them yeah. mm -hmm. and see was this person there or not. Yep. All right. That's what we're looking for. So the first thing you want to do before you mix your cast together is you kind of want to set that dirt. You want those particles to kind of stick together. Now at home, you can use hairspray for this, which All is right. great. So if you have a nice aerosol hairspray. We're actually going to use dust and dirt hardener that uh, is actually from the forensic supply company. And you kind of want to stay far enough away so that you're not moving those particles around. So you kind of just lightly put a mist over that. All right. And you're going to let it sit for just a minute. So the length that it takes you to mix up your plaster is sufficient time. You know, and that's that just set. to bind some of those looser particles so it's together. Bind it together and mm -hmm. help those particles stick together because when you start to pour your plaster on, we don't want it pushing those particles apart from one another. Yep. All right, so when you mix your plaster of Paris, and you can get this in Home Depot or yeah, just you know, any, any hardware store, right, any type craft of hardware stores store. even have these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to add water. We're going to give you the exact measurements on that later, but you just want to get a really nice liquid consistency, but you don't want it uh, too runny. But you don't want it too thick either. We want it to flow really nice. So yeah. we're going to start mixing this. And you can kind of tell if whether you have enough water or not. So let's get a little bit more. Now, Plaster of Paris sets very quickly. Very quickly. So you really have to work fast. And you want to get all the lumps out. So you just keep kneading and kneading till you don't feel any more lumps. And this, and does, this, not is make, close. this does not make good bread. No, no, no. <laughs> 
it's really Maybe close. I'm thinking just a touch more water, I think. Yes, just Not a much. little bit more. Once you get close to the end, a little tiny bit of water can go a long yeah, way. Yeah, it's go a long way. So it is close. Um, now, what might you compare the consistency of this? I think like something like a real runny jam or something that will yes. flow. It's going to flow, but, flow, just but it's spread not going to spread. Right. Definitely not thick okay. like peanut butter. We don't want no. peanut butter. Peanut butter would that not will work. work. Now, right. what I recommend is zip up your bag about three-fourths on top so that you have just like a pour spout here. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the key is when you do this is you want to start above the impression by just a little bit because you don't want to pour it directly on to your impression. If you poured it right into it, it, it could like some smoosh it out and, right. and cause that dirt to flow out exactly. there as well. Exactly. So we are going to, and it's already getting too thick. Look at oh, that. Oh man. It is setting so fast. Okay, let's yes, give it a little, little touch bit more, more water, water and then be ready to go. It goes, it sets so fast. Let's do this quick. Now in the crime scene unit, they don't use plaster of Paris anymore. They do use dental stone because you have a little bit more freedom uh, and time to get this just right. But let's see if we can get this out now. So what do you want to do is you want to pour it just above your impression, okay? There it goes. And what we want to do is we want to push that plaster of Paris into the impression just behind where the impression is. You want to pour it so that it flows into the oppression and not necessarily um, goes directly on it, if that makes sense. Yeah, we don't want to flood it right, out. Right, we don't want to flood it out. And it is getting really thick fast. So Mr. Patterson, can you grab a popsicle stick? You can do this at mm -hmm. home. And what you want to do is right, start pushing it down. So go ahead and start smearing it over the impression. Mm -hmm. so like a bulldozer. Right. You're just going to take it and start and pushing it, it down because this stuff sets so fast. And the trick is to try not to disturb those edges. Now this, because we're working so quickly here, we might not get a Let's full see. impression. You can get mm -hmm. part of it. Ooh, it got thick fast. It really did. Barely getting any off the surface. There we go. Tell. And if you do have to push down, just you want gentle, direct quick. down right. pressure, Oops, don't do not that. up and down. Okay. Good enough. All right. Yeah, because it's like pretty much already. It's getting there. Setting. Okay. So to reinforce it a little bit, mm -hmm. we did this when we did the casting with Buddy oh, as right. well. When we cast, we use these craft sticks. So you can break these up, mm -hmm. and use them in different positions. So you just kind of you want to gently wiggle it into the surface. You don't want to press it down really hard. This and, must be and rapid setting it. plaster. Man, Paris. that is going. Quick. It is like. And you kind of want to put them all different directions. And this is going to help stabilize things after it dries. We were wondering if this would be set by the end of the episode. I think, I think it's going it to might be. be. And I think I just cracked look out the I bottom know, look, it's there. already, wow. <laughs> all right, and what you can do too is put your initials in the bottom. All right, so when mm -hmm. it dries, you know who made that cast. Uh, and you would let this sit. Now, if it's outside, you would let it sit for at least 30 minutes before you try to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's in this box, you can let it sit for 24 hours before you try to clean yeah. it. All right? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now this would be our evidence. We're mm -hmm. going to set that aside for a minute and talk about some other things. Um, we've got people joining us from Kentucky and Syracuse and Michigan. People saying hi to Claude. And uh, Fiorella says the gorilla foot looks more like a more like a hand than a there foot and that's really <laughs> true because they've got that thumb on their foot really that sticks out to the side rather than being straight in line so a very key difference between us and the primates like gorillas and orangutans and chimps mm -hmm. okay so you've got some casts that you've already yes. made here mm -hmm. and when we think about analyzing footprints um, there are some very key things people are probably going to recognize that different shoes are going to come in some mm -hmm. uh, various classes that you call them. So we've got yes. class traits yes. and we've got individual traits. Yes. What's the difference between those mm -hmm. two groups of traits? So when we're talking about shoes, a class trait is something very general. All right. So it could be brand name. Okay. It could be size. All right. So I know what size shoe do you wear, Mr. Patterson? Uh, usually a 13, a sometimes 13. a 14. <laughs> I wear a size 8, right? So that would be uh, just a what we call a class characteristic. Okay. All right. And what's really interesting is 
there, you know, there's, it can help eliminate evidence. Like you can use class character, it can be valuable, mm -hmm. right? We could, you know, eliminate Nike brand if it's an Adidas class characteristic, yeah. okay. all right? Mm -hmm. So it can be very helpful. Or it could be something like a cowboy boot that has a very flat, smooth sole right. versus- With a pointed toe. Yeah, versus right. another versus, type of a sneaker exactly. or a work boot. Mm -hmm. So those are classes, those are broad categories right. that we could distinguish. Even color would be a class characteristic. Mm -hmm. It would give us information, but it doesn't give us enough to individualize it. We okay. couldn't link it back to one person, and that's the goal. All right. Right. Is okay. To link so it class back. is a general category. General, right. And then individual traits. Individual traits are unique marks that only that person could have uh, caused, like a certain type of wear on the bottom of their shoe. Okay. Because what's really here, here's what's cool: two people can wear the exact same shoe. They could buy it the same day, same manufacturer, right? Same production line right exact same shoe and there is a zero percent chance it's actually one octillion chance which is one with 27 zeros that's behind a it, right? lot of zeros <laughs> that <laughs> someone is going to get the exact same wear marks on the bottom of their shoes because we all walk differently we mm -hmm. live in different places we go to different places right and that's going to cause the soles right, of the shoes to wear in to different get different ways. marks so individual marks would be any type of gouge marks on the bottom you know, okay. burn marks that you may get, tread patterns like that get worn out in certain places mm -hmm. because of the way you walk. Sure. Uh, all of those would be individual characteristics. So if I'm out disc golfing and I step on a locust thorn on hole two at Idlewild because exactly. there's a huge locust tree, <laughs> right. that's going to poke a hole in the middle of my shoe and leave a very distinct mark. Very distinct. And then that's a potential individual characteristic mm -hmm. that we could see in these footprints. Exactly. So it almost sounds a lot like what we talked about with fingerprints. Mm -hmm. okay, we called those things minutia when we looked at those right. individual Details. characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are distinct ways we're going to identify. Yes. So let's go ahead and look at one of these uh, one of these casts that we've made here already. Mm -hmm. Now these casts have we they came from these like known shoes we would say, all right? So these mm -hmm. particular people wore this particular shoe and we use this shoe to make this cast. And so what we do when we look at the bottom, we see these the tread pattern on the bottom is we can see similar markings on the on the cast. So you can especially see this unique swoop right here. This would be characteristic of this brand of shoe, right? So we would know that this shoe made this cast because you can see the end of, you know, the unique mark here, uh, the trademark of that brand. Now on a cast, sometimes it's very difficult to see those individual marks. We can definitely determine certain class characteristics and you can definitely see how you have these striations here. They distinctly match that shoe pattern and you can see it as well. So on in this one. yeah, mm -hmm. in this in this one, it looks like this cast has picked up a lot of the sand mm -hmm. that it was bedded in, and it's kind of stuck in the material. This one's a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. So different casts are different you might get different soil. levels of de um, exactly of detail in those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then this one here as well, you can see, especially on these individual marks that we have here, yeah. this pointed. So we've got down this here, little this the pattern. chevron mm -hmm. pattern here, and then. This shoe is obviously in the class Nike brand. You can see the swoosh symbol here, and we can make that out. It's a, probably a little Fairly difficult to, to see, see on yeah. the camera, but it's there. But you can see this very distinct, almost like that looks know, like the that. Jumpman Michael <laughs> right Jordan here, symbol kind of stylized. Right? You can see it right here. Yep, but we can see that very clearly that triangular mm -hmm. pattern right here. In that in impression. Mm -hmm. Now he does have very unique wear. In fact, he's got a hole in the bottom of his shoe, but yep. we cannot really see that here at all. We'd have to scrape that off a little bit more. You have to be careful when you clean your impression because you don't want to scrape off that detail. And you can see here, this person had a very unique tread, right? These very all over the bottom of the shoe. We could very quickly say, you know, that is definitely not one of these shoes, right? Because the tread pattern is distinctly different. So that is one way that we can use casting uh, to, you know, make possible matches between suspects and we can, you know, acquire that and then, you know, link that up with somebody mm -hmm. based on those patterns and, and unique characteristics that we see, especially size of the shoe too, right? Yeah, we absolutely. Determine that. Mm -hmm. So what's even more valuable though is when you can actually get like an inked impression of that shoe because you see a lot more detail than you do on a cast, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. And so we have a couple examples here to show you. We can just set those out on top there, I think. Okay. We've got uh, Kofi joining us from Ghana in Africa, so that's cool to see. And Craig and Luke, uh, faithful viewers here with us. And there's um, Ophiri, I believe, from Ghana. So a couple people joining us oh, from Africa today. Very cool awesome. with that. Okay, so here, this would be a situation 
where you might have um, either a substance on a hard surface mm -hmm. that captures some of the print. So yes. we, it could be a sticky substance or a powdery substance. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if they had walked through, say there was some colored dust on the floor or chalk or something, it would leave behind an impression that mm -hmm. you could see, but then it'd be very challenging to try to lift that print. Yes. We actually use a device that's called an electrostatic dust lifter. When there is a dust impression, uh, they actually use almost like an electric signal to take that dust and it adheres to a special film mm -hmm. so that you can get a, you know, get impression a nice clear impression. Mm -hmm. They could also yeah. use photographic, um, sure. uh, take the impression photographically and mm -hmm. see those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we've got, you would call this a partial print yes. because it doesn't have the complete toe and missing part of mm -hmm. the heel. And this would be a print that we might make. So if we had a suspect and there was enough evidence to get a warrant to um, search their home and mm -hmm. gather evidence. And ask them to take an impression, yeah. right? Which is what this is. We had a suspect, right? Mm -hmm. A pretend suspect. And we asked them to walk across this. And what's interesting, you can actually see how that person walks. Yeah. You know, because you're missing that heel and that toe. Mm -hmm. So these, these patterns that you see in the shoe can actually talk about or help us understand the way someone walks. So this shoe over here, if you look the way that it's worn here on the outside edge of the heel, now this would be the outside edge of the shoe, this is the inside where the arch would be up here, and you can see the patterns over here. So this person walks, if they walked, their feet would be tipped outward, so their ankles are outward. We call that pronation and supination. So here's how I remember the difference between those two. If I take my hands, and we talked about this with Dr. Purdom when we talked about the way our bones rotate in our hands. Mm -hmm. So if I want some soup in a bowl, my hands are turned upward and outward. So if you would think about your feet, your feet would tip out if they were supinated. And if they're pronated, they're gonna rotate in. So the different angles that our bodies mm -hmm form when we walk can actually tell us about, um, our, these prints can tell us those things about our bodies. These shoes can be used to understand how people walk. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people like chiropractors and others will use, they'll look at your shoe and say, mm -hmm. oh, you walk this way. Um, when I've had uh, problems with my knees and things, they'll do that and try and understand mm -hmm. walking patterns. So those even show up in these, in the in these prints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So these exhibits that we've mm -hmm. got here, these are actually, this would be maybe a very small partial that we'd find in a crime yes. scene. And usually and this is what you're gonna find a lot more partials usually than you are a complete Yes, this print. is a pretty yes. big, this isn't totally complete, but it's yes. pretty big. And then this mm -hmm. one on exhibit C mm -hmm. over here, you can see this very clear cross pattern that shows up down here. Mm -hmm. And you can see the curve the bottom. as well, the curve of the heel matches the curve that we see here. Mm -hmm. So the wear pattern on the shoe matches in both of these samples. Get an almost identical curve there. So there would be an extremely high probability that the person who left this print was wearing this shoe. Was wearing that shoe. Now this, what we're doing right here, this process is called operational science mm -hmm. because we're looking at evidence in the present and yes. we can physically look at it. Everyone can compare these mm -hmm. things together and agree on it. So when we try to figure out, did this shoe leave this print, mm -hmm. we're stepping out of that and we're entering into historical, historical science. science. And in this case, a, a specific type we call forensic science. Mm -hmm. So how, why is it important to make those distinctions when we're talking about mm -hmm. these things? Because in forensic science, we do use observational skills all the mm -hmm. time. That's how we you know, compare DNA or fingerprints or shoe print impressions, right? We use observational science, we use our five senses. But we have to apply that to an event that happened in the past, mm -hmm. right? You weren't there, right, to no. see that person step on this, right? Or he wasn't there to see the evidence left behind. So we take that evidence and we look at it, we evaluate it, we compare it, but then we have to apply it to something that has happened in the past. We have to make assumptions, right? We have yes. to make interpretations. Mm -hmm. So because of that, uh, it's not observational science, it's historical science, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes there could be errors, you know, because we weren't there to witness it. So. Yeah. And I always use a phrase, I say, the facts don't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. These are facts we can agree to 
to the fact that that shoe impression seems to match this one. Yes. But did that shoe leave that? That doesn't tell us that. It might right. give us a clue toward that or suggest mm -hmm. that that's a best explanation. Yes. But we make those assumptions and we, we come to conclusions about them in the past. Mm -hmm. All right, I do have a question here from Paul. He asks, can plaster of Paris create heat that can be dangerous to the body if you use it for casting? Yes, it can. Okay. Plaster of Paris will get warm as it sets. So it's very important that you do not immerse your hands in mm -hmm. it. Plaster of Paris is not something good to take molds of children's hands or yes. impressions of their feet uh, because it can cause severe burns and people have actually been disfigured uh, because they have used plaster of Paris for that. Yeah, reason. so there are so, other specific types yes. of, of modeling plasters and other things mm -hmm. that you can use. Uh, other gels that harden that are much better if you want to take a cast of a hand or hand. Yes. now if you're just pressing a handprint in and, and removing Very quickly, it right. you'll be okay and not a problem mm -hmm. but you would never want to like submerge Immerse, your right. hand <laughs> exactly. in that plaster yes. it could it could definitely burn you mm -hmm. yes absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. all right good question all right so looking at this tread pattern we get you know class characteristics, but there are some individual characteristics here. There is unique wear like we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So you can see, if you look very closely, little tiny dots, well that's gouge marks that are unique to this individual person. Yeah. That exact same mark here. So that's a detail that's an individual characteristic on and especially both of these. this like unique circle we see here it looks like something this person stepped on something this is not manufacturing so we can see that here as well we can see part of that circle here and that would be one of those individual characteristics that we're looking for mm -hmm. uh, when we're comparing now if all we had was this little corner this was the only evidence seen you can still see we get a get a pretty good match right along here and this pattern looks like it clearly came from this section of the shoe. And we might even be able to look at, I think this, this little spot right here probably lines up exactly with that spot right there. Mm -hmm. You can see a little tiny nub sticking out there. So these little individual details would help us identify that. And then here we have the outside edge. We can line all those pieces up. So it doesn't take much as far as a shoe print to leave behind enough evidence to be able to compare that and, exactly. and match it. Just like fingerprints. Mm -hmm. um, now you told me before when we did the fingerprint episode that a judge would want to see 10 matches? 10, ten points ten and matching it's very points. similar to shoes as well. Okay. Yes, it's between 8 and 10 would be say points of identification, unique identifying factors mm -hmm. uh, to go to court and say we believe that it's likely this person. Like we said because there's such a small percentage that two people can wear the same shoe, uh, it's pretty yeah. much a 0% chance. And especially if we could get the evidence from the suspect and say he owned exactly. those shoes and those pieces mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. So, um, I don't see any more questions coming in, but we've got lots of people joining us from all over the world. Awesome. So we have shifted the program to a later time slot at 2 o'clock, so it looks like mm -hmm. we're picking up a lot more traffic. Thank you guys for joining us yeah. from all over the place. Okay, so when we think about... Um, all of these things, we're back to that concept of justice. And here we bring earthly justice based on the laws of the land that are hopefully based on righteous laws from God. Mm -hmm. And it's just another reminder that in this sin-cursed world, people are going to do evil things because of our hearts and mm -hmm. pointing us to the forgiveness that we need in Christ because of those things. But criminals can be forgiven if we're honest with ourselves mm -hmm. We're all criminals in some way, especially in God's eyes and breaking his law. So again, we can use these scientific principles to help us um, understand how crime scene investigation works, but we always want to carry these things back to, to glorifying God and as often as possible, connecting it back to gospel truths. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for sharing about that with us, but um, we've got one other thing we want to close with, a little bit of promo material. If you were really interested in this type of stuff, there's an opportunity for you to 
come and take one of our high school labs. Why don't you go yes. ahead and explain a little bit about what those are? Yes, yeah, so we have three different programs we're offering next year for our high school lab year, uh, and that is biology, chemistry, and forensics. Uh, so I am the instructor for the biology and forensics, and Mr. Patterson is the instructor for the chemistry course. Uh, and it involves 12 days here at the museum throughout the year uh, where you'll get 24 hands-on labs. Uh, so you get two, two full out, two, two hour, Yes. Full labs each day that you come, uh, and we'll be covering curriculum that we'll kind of outline for you, as well as suggest a you know textbook that you could use mm -hmm. as well at home for those courses. Uh, but our students have thoroughly enjoyed those, and yes. we just had an awesome year here. Yep, getting uh, great feedback. Museum. Now this last year with the rough circumstances, we yes. lost a few classes, but we're praying that won't happen this year. So if you're interested, I've been for those uh, one day, um, two days a week every month, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, through the fall and then into the spring. Mm -hmm. We'd love to teach you and help you understand more about God's creation. Do full dissections, full chemistry labs, full forensic investigations, mm -hmm. all kinds of great things. Which is often very difficult for parents at home. Yes. So we provide that experience for them yes. here. Yes, great microscopes, mm -hmm. great equipment yep. that you can use. And from and, a biblical yeah, worldview. And always coming from that biblical yes. perspective. All right, thank you guys for joining us. We'll be featuring uh, some more of this on Friday in the hands-on episode, so we hope you'll join us in. And until then, get out and explore all of God's amazing